This is our town hall and it's really exciting to see so many people here. Some are familiar faces, some are new faces and we're really excited for all of that all of you took time out of your busy day to join us today for this really interesting topic. Um, we also have uh, evaluations on your chairs so please Take a moment at the end of this to fill out the evaluations that will help us be able to do more events like this that are interesting to all of you. Um, so enjoy this great panel and we'll let them introduce themselves and I'd like to pass the mic to Katherine Heinrichsen from Seattle University's Project for, to, from Family Homelessness. Thank you, Dana, and welcome everyone. Welcome to Seattle U. We're really happy that you're here. We're really happy to partner with Resolution to End Homelessness and Tech for Housing. Thank you so much for coming. I also want to acknowledge that we are here on Duwamish, Duwamish excuse me, indigenous land and invite you to join me in respecting their elders and descendants and all descendants of indigenous people locally. I also want to thank a couple of um, organizations who are here to help us get even more civ civically engaged. We have Valerie from Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness in the back who has voter registration information. She's also recruiting people who would like to take another step and help uh, uh, learn how to register people to vote, especially people who are homeless, because they may not realize that they can register and vote, even if they're homeless. Back in this corner, we have folks from Seattle's Democracy Voucher Program. How many people have already turned in their vouchers? Okay, I'm not gonna embarrass you by asking how many people didn't know they came in January and you threw them away, because apparently that happens too. But you can get them replaced. If you have questions, please stop by their table and hear about how you can make contributions to help people whose voices aren't normally heard have a bigger presence in this election. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Ethan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ethan Goodman, Executive Director of Tech for Housing. Uh, we're a nonprofit advocacy group that engages the tech sector, particularly around issues of housing and homelessness. Uh, so if you're in the tech sector or know people who are in the tech sector who really care about these issues and are wondering how they can get engaged, uh, Tech for Housing is a good place to send them to. Um, for this panel, we're going to be taking audience questions on the note cards that are on your table. So at any time uh, throughout the panel, if you have a question you'd like to hear the panel address, uh, just jot it down on the note card, legibly if you can. And I'm going to be sitting over here in this corner, so if you can get that question to me uh, or to Catherine, uh, we'll answer those questions uh, towards the end of the hour. And I think with that, I'll turn it over to Michael Hobbs. And thank you so much to all of our panelists and to Michael for moderating. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so my name is Michael Hobbs. I'm a reporter for the Huffington Post. Uh, I'm moderating today's panel. And before I get to our excellent panelists, uh, I just want to mention a couple things kind of framing the debate in Seattle. I've been covering the homelessness debate around the country for about two years now. Uh, I did an article about Salt Lake City, which some of you may remember solved homelessness, but it turned out to be slightly more complicated than that. Um, <laughs> Thanks. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that we're in the middle of this debate about homelessness and an election that is really hinging on homelessness and a lot of other cities in the country are having exactly the same debate. And one of the things that you realize when you start looking into homelessness around the country is that nationally, homelessness has been falling for years. So about 10 years ago, there were 650,000 homeless people in America, and now there's around 550,000 homeless people in America. And so that might surprise you if you live in Seattle, but there's been actually a lot of successes on this issue. But what we see is that homelessness is now concentrating in certain cities. So once you start looking into the cities where it is increasing, what you find is that nearly all of them are in the middle of the same boom that Seattle is in the middle of. So if you look at a place like Reno, where homelessness has tripled, they got a factory from Tesla, the Gigafactory, that's going to be making batteries there. And median incomes are up, 
jobs are up, there's all these sort of ancillary industries, it's all good news until you look at the homelessness news. And it's the same thing in Boise where they have this kind of medical research cluster, same thing, homelessness has doubled, housing prices are through the roof. Orlando, Salt Lake City, Bozeman, Montana has one of the biggest increases in homelessness in the country, which is really interesting. And so you find these pockets where homelessness isn't a sign of decay anymore, it's a sign of prosperity. And so there's this sense in which something has sort of fundamentally changed and fundamentally broken where we have all this good news and then the homelessness is the one piece of bad news that's absolutely devastating for the people experiencing it. So that said, there's also some unique aspects of the Seattle experience that we have the third highest number of homeless people, raw numbers in the country. It's New York and then LA and then us. And so we have more homeless folks than cities much larger than us, than Houston, than Chicago, than Miami. I don't totally know the reasons why that is. Um, so there are typical aspects of the Seattle experience and there are unique aspects of the Seattle experience. So I, I just want everybody to kind of keep that in mind that the rest of the country is having a lot of the same debates that we are. So now I'll get to our panel. Um, first we have Lauren McGowan, which I'm pronouncing, okay. Uh, <laughs> who's the Senior Director of Ending Homelessness and Poverty for United Way. She's been here for 14 years, many mayors. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it there, because you guys have a, there's bios on your sheet, so I won't, I won't spend too much time on each person. Uh, next we have Richard Waters, who works at Neighbor Care Health. He works with mostly homeless folks as a doctor, so dealing with the medical issues that come along with homelessness. Uh, next we have Colleen Echohawk, who's the executive director of the Chief Seattle Club, which is a nonprofit that works with native peoples experiencing homelessness. And last we have Lisa Dugard, uh, who's from the Public Defender Association and also founded the LEAD, L-E-A-D program, which if you do reporting around Seattle, everybody talks about all the time. Uh, so I'm just gonna start out sort of with a sort of table setting question. I'm obsessed with misconceptions. I think other people are obsessed with misconceptions. For each one of you, what is sort of the greatest misconception about homelessness? Like, what do you find yourself describing to people at cocktail parties over and over again? We can start with. Sure, well, first off, thanks for having us, and thank you all for being here. Um, I cannot believe in 2019 we are actually having an argument about whether homelessness is a housing issue, right? Yes, <laughs> and it's true, right? I mean, every day if you're on social media um, or having a, you know, conversations with folks, um, there are folks who want to say that we have a drug problem or we have a crime problem. Yes, those are issues, but homelessness is a housing issue, and until we solve that, we won't solve this crisis. Richard? I totally agree with that, and um, thank you all for being here. I, I will try and put a, a, a medical kind of spin, health lens, because I think that's the reason that I'm on the panel. So, um, um, And so I, I will speak a lot to mental health and substance use disorders, and I think one of the misconceptions is that the problem lies with the individuals, mm -hmm. that maybe they, they don't want services, they aren't interested in treatment, whereas it's really, um, have we designed a system that is really responsive to the needs of individuals? There's actually a very large number, um, good surveys, I see it daily, most individuals that I encounter, most that um, in surveys at needle exchanges are interested in some kind of treatment if they have a substance use disorder, are interested in housing, are interested in shelter. We just need to make sure that our systems are nimble enough mm -hmm. um, to, to meet those needs. Well, I am so grateful to be here. Thank you all for coming. And I love seeing some awesome kids over here. Glad that the kid, the youth voice is in the room. Um, <laughs> You have a lot of power. Your, your voice is super important, so we're really glad you're here. Um, I just um, want to wholeheartedly agree with Lauren and Richard, and I know my dear colleague Lisa, my left here. Um, I, I agree that you know we have to, we have a housing crisis in our city. We have mental health um, resources that are not being resourced in the way they should be. But underlying all of that, we have a problem of systemic racism. This issue and crisis of homelessness started in our city in 1865 when native people, there was city ordinance that said native people are not allowed in this city. In a city and in an area that was thriving 
with the Coast Salish community. They had thriving um, longhouses that took care and sustained their communities. And they were forced out of the city with a wave of invasion and colonization by community members that thought of them as, as savages and thought of them, um, thought of our relatives as, as people that were not as important. And so that was the start and the, and the, the beginning of the crisis of homelessness in our city. And until we address the systemic racism that is underlying all of these issues, we will not solve for housing, we will not solve for mental health, and we will not solve for um, all of the other issues that go along with our, our crisis of homelessness in our city. Um, well, the, the misconception that I'll lift up is the idea that um, there are service resistant people. Mm -hmm. um, as a, a team that we work with in Hawaii who are implementing a version of the LEAD program in Hawaii said, and I just, I haven't heard this locally, um, uh, there are not service resistant people. There are people or client resistant services. And um, so, yes, what, um, which is sort of what Richard said. Um, one of the things, over and over again, we hear that, you know, like a team showed up and in an encampment, people were offered services. They did not say yes, they declined services. That just should be, that should be illegal. <laughs> that, that statement should be illegal. I don't really believe that, but um, uh, it would be fun. Um, uh, 364 days mandatory in jail, if you say that. Um, it is fun. Um, okay, so uh, because really what that reflects is that the methodology being employed does not match the clinical trauma-driven circumstances of the person who's being engaged. And, you know, things work that are well-designed to meet specific circumstances and things that are not well-designed to meet specific circumstances fail. You have not tested, like as a city, we are not testing whether things that work, work. We're testing whether things that are not designed to work, work, and of course they don't. And so as um, somebody who easily could and should be up here with us, uh, Chloe Gale with the REACH program, often says, you know, REACH does not ever encounter somebody who's not houseable. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it takes a minute, especially when you're talking about prevalence of mental illness and people who are cognitively in a different place than sort of a cost-benefit analysis would, you know, easily engage. Um, it takes a minute to work with people from where they're at, but people, um, every, everyone is engageable and everyone is helpable. I mean, and I don't mean to minimize personality disorders and meth-induced psychosis and really complicated circumstances, but um, so that's the, the idea that people are resistant to services is the misconception I think is most damaging. Thanks. So I want to direct this to Colleen and Lauren, both of whom know the political system really well. We're in the middle of a city council election. The purpose of this event is to help people be informed voters. And we often see large promises made by city council members. And I think it's really important to talk about what can and can't the city council do on homelessness. So maybe, Lauren, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, you know, I think homelessness obviously um, is both caused by and the solutions come from every level, right? There are, there are uh, There's investments that we need in a significant way at the federal level. Um, we have, you know, if you just look across the country, only one quarter of people that are income eligible for a housing subsidy actually receive it. That's a fundamental flaw Right, and that comes from Congress. Um, so there, there are there are mass um, issues that I think are, are hard for city council to address, but there's so much that can be done, and part of that starts with understanding um, that we do need more housing that we need to prevent homelessness from happening in the first place, and that needs to be done with a racial equity lens, and that all of this is going to take more resources. And so when I look toward city council candidates, you know, if somebody is saying we can do this just by making things more efficient, by asking our service providers to be more accountable, they, they are wrong. That, that is not, we're not going to solve our issue that way, right? And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be accountable, of course. Uh, we absolutely should. But we need candidates that understand this issue and are willing to go to bat both at a local level with taxpayers and with our delegation in D.C. to say we need more resources if we're going to solve this. 
I totally agree. The resource issue is paramount. So I'm not going to keep going on that um, because you handled that wonderfully, Lauren, as usual. Um, Lauren and I were laughing like, it's been a, a couple of months since we've been on a panel together. We're, all, we're often on panels together, and it's great to see you again. Um, I think that the opportunity for a candidate is to truly take on this um, crisis of homelessness that we have and make it their their message. Because one thing that I feel like is lacking in our in our system right now is vision and leadership and someone saying, getting out there and saying, this is what we can do. I, th I often run into people, and perhaps that's why some of you are here, it, I run into people say, I just don't know what to do. I, I feel so upset because there's like a whole you know, encampment near my house and there's all this garbage and it looks ugly and I know that they're, they're good people in there, but Colleen, what do I do? And, and I can give them some, some places to go, but we need stronger messaging from our city council. We need stronger messaging from the mayor's office saying, this is the opportunity because I think that we live in a city where people genuinely want to do something. We genuinely have people that are saying, I will, I will give dollars, I will give money, I will give time. And they um, don't know where to go. And so I hope that a candidate will really take this opportunity and say, here's what can happen. Here is um, our opportunity to shine as a city, to say that we love and will take care of our relatives who are living on the street. Mm -hmm. Can I add a quick comment? Um, I think folks should mistrust candidates um, and current officials who look to their own tiny little circle to generate the, that vision that Colleen is talking about. There is an incredible degree of unanimity in this city and in this region among people who know and do this work about what's missing and what works. And no one is listening to those people, mm -hmm. full stop. Mm -hmm. So to me, the top line thing is not Here's my plan. It's like the, the first point of the plan should be, I'm going to go enlist the experts who are nation-leading thinkers about how to unravel these problems, who live right here, and give them full access, open door, and I'm going to listen to those people if they say I'm on the wrong track. So Lisa, if I can ask a follow-up on that, one thing that's so interesting about the campaign so far is that we've heard a lot about the role of police, the role of criminalization. Mm -hmm. I think most people agree that there's some role for the criminal justice system in homelessness. What do you think that role should be? How should the current role change? Um, okay, a couple of quick observations. One, so I was a, I'm no longer practicing public defense, but that's where I started when I moved back to Seattle in 1996. I was a public defender in municipal court for years and then supervised that work. And I can say we are not, by and large, criminalizing homelessness in Seattle in 2019. We did, and I can tell you this because it used to be very different. We used to have vastly more people going through Seattle Municipal Court um, charged with things like camping in the park, um, failure to appear in response to citations for drinking in public, urinating in public, for complex reasons do significantly to the leadership of the current city attorney, Pete Holmes. Cases that used to be filed are no longer filed. The police have noticed that and no longer make arrests and book people into jail in the expectation um, that those cases will be prosecuted. And that's all good, something that I have supported. And, um, you know, Pete Holmes wasn't wrong to make those changes and the police weren't wrong to notice that it was no longer, it was sort of pointless to keep booking people into jail. So we have succeeded in radically reducing the utilization of the criminal justice system for issues of homelessness. That is not to say that people who are homeless are not inducted into the criminal justice system way disproportionately, they are, but typically not purely for crimes of public living, which did used to be, did used to happen, and it could happen again. So the pro so and I, and I want to give credit here and a shout out uh, though we may disagree about other but we do disagree about certain other topics that are in the news right now um, Chief Best has done a tremendous job of articulating that we will not arrest people for being poor in public we will not do that and I and and that has required leadership and she is exhibiting that leadership so I want to really call that out and there are pressures on her very substantial pressures to move the other way there are also pressures on Pete I don't know if he's going to run again 
but if he did, this will be this would be the first time um, that he will face a very strong challenge from the right um, on the question of whether or not we should go back to the days of Mark Sidron and Tom Carr and the aggressive use of um, the uh, criminal charges as a response to public disorder issues that stem from extreme poverty. Okay, so. Um, it's just my notes on like where we are. What is the appropriate role? This is what I want to say to presumed allies in this room. <laughs> we cannot expect um, to maintain a situation where we are not um, criminalizing homelessness. Um, we, we, criminal justice involvement makes everything worse, right? It cuts people off of Medicaid. It, if you're in jail for more than 90 days, you get removed from the homelessness housing priority list. Um, it is traumatizing. It breaks connections. Um, it makes you more and more unemployable, more and more. So all the things, you lose your housing, all the things become worse. So the criminal justice system is a driver of homelessness, and that is well established. Um, but we cannot... Um, the, the, the problem, I think, is that there's a huge pressure on our leaders to use that system, which as devastating and damaging as it is, it is always open. It always comes, maybe not as fast as some people want, but it does always come, it is always there. We don't have a version of that on the human services side. And the an anemic nature of our public health and social service alternative to that creates a void where the thirst for action and urgency, people just, they reach for the thing that they've been taught to reach for, which is come and get this person and take them away to the place that will take them. And the only place that that is, is jail. So we have to urgently fill that void or we can predict that we will face a backlash that ramps up criminalization of um, extreme poverty again, and it has not been long uh, since we've lived in a city where that was the the dominant paradigm. Richard, maybe you want to pick up on that. That what are the medical implications of the current homelessness policies, and especially criminalization? Yeah, um, I totally agree with Lisa. Um, the criminal justice exposure to the criminal justice system um, rarely. Um, I, I never. It, it is. It is not something that it goes is going to improve health, or improve kind of the the end goal that I think everyone around Seattle, everywhere around the country, sees, which is um, helping individuals become housed, helping them access services for health health services that they are interested in. Um, the criminal justice system can often be viewed as this kind of inter like um, immediate. Um, solve because I, as someone who may be housed, is no longer seeing this this obstruction, seeing this encampment, seeing these, these individuals that do appear to be in distress. Um, I think it is also wrong to kind of say that that reaction, kind of like Lisa was referring to, this, this rea there, there is a reaction to want to do something. There is a community filled with individuals who want to see progress. Um, and, and I would say, and, and kudos to LEAD, um, I think we are, and, and to the public health system in King County, we are starting to see this development of the alternative. Um, um, criminaliza criminalization of, of um, small amounts of drug possession or drug use, that, that also doesn't make, make sense. From, even from just looking at it from a taxpayer perspective, like that does not, that, that is not a good use of taxpayer money to say, um, you know, if, if imagine if I am housed, I am home, I am using illicit drugs in small quantities, um, and the cops had some way of, of knowing that, does it make sense to arrest that person for that use? Um, no, it doesn't. That's not a great, great thing for the individual. It's not a great use of public resources. But the, the question has been, well, so the alternative is do nothing is what some people will ask, but that, you know, that's, we need to fill in that space so that the alternative is not jail or nothing. Um, and we are, we, we are doing a good job, even though in the last six years and in, in, you know, from when I was doing residency at Harborview, um, you have know, been in Seattle for now coming on eight years and the, the landscape, even within the healthcare environment, which has historically kind of said addiction is a public health issue. It's a, it's a medical condition. Um, there has been a rapid transformation in how the medical community um, views and, and is starting to embrace people with substance use disorders. Um, 
from where it was used to be. Addictions are something that specialty services will handle. The healthcare system in its broad kind of pers in broad range, hospitals, emergency departments, community clinics, mental health agencies even, um, you know, that's, that's, that's not quite for those systems. And that, and that has rapidly changed. Hospitals, ERs, community health clinics, mental health clinics, they're starting to really embrace the care of people with substance use disorders and we're building this other that is not jail, that is not do nothing and let people just kind of sort their own way out. Um, so agreed very much. Jail is, is um, can have a certain degree of satisfaction because it feels like we're doing something with immediacy. Um, it is not going to be a winning long-term solution or a winning cost-effective solution. Does anyone on the panel know the, the cost of a night in jail? It's like more than the Four Seasons, isn't it? Um, they, they, they do have published data. The Washington Criminal uh, Corrections Facility does have um, published data on how much, at varying degrees of institutions, of, of prisons or jails, how much it costs per night. And um, I don't know the number per night off the top of my head, but it was, on average, m um, far more expensive than um, if you were to average a year in permanent supportive housing. Um, it is more than that would cost. Colleen, do you maybe want to pick up the disparities issue? Of, of course, these things don't apply to everyone equally. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the data is absolutely clear that if you are a person of color, you are more likely to be homeless in our system, not just here in the city of Seattle, but that's a national statistic. We know that in Seattle, um, the most recent point in time count show that Native American, Alaska Native people are 10% of our homeless population. When you consider that in King County, we make up less than 1% of the total population, that is an incredible, incredible disparity. Um, I, I've, I just recently, I can't stop saying, it's a moral outrage. I'm super dramatic, if you can't tell. Um, <laughs> but, but I can't think of any other words or any other way to describe it and to, to help people understand stand the pain of it. Because when we think about disparity, we have to think about the racial inequities and the blatant racism in our country that has led to this issue we have right now. And if we are going to think about how we're going to actively solve for all homelessness, then we have to be incredibly passionate about thinking about how we break down those systems of racism that are a part of the current system now. Let me give you an example. We, um, in 2017, we started getting way more involved in, in the data than, the data is so hard, by the way. You should look into it, it's crazy. But one of the things that I saw was that 80, um, there's, there's a system in place called the coordinate entry system, coordinate entry for all. And if you want to get into housing, you have to like uh, go through this system. I could tell you a lot about that whole system and how racist it is, but I'll, I'll tell you the outcome and you'll see. So I saw the numbers that said, um, here, here are the people that got called and said, hey, your housing is ready for you. You're going to get it. You're ready to go. I saw that 84% of the Native people who got that call did not get the housing. 84%, that is a remarkable number. What we have to understand is that there is no reason for Native community to trust another government system of housing. We're not stupid, we've seen it fail over and over and over again. And so if we get that call, there's all these historical traumas and triggers that go bling, 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 and that's why that has not been a success for Native community. We also see it in the African American community, in the immigrant and refugee community. So we ha if we think about how we address these these systems, part of, of, of what I would say to a candidate is that the money, the dollars that are coming in should be going to organizations that address these systemic racism that are part is part of the system. It should go based, I think, on, on the numbers. I'm, I will boldly say that I think 10% of the city of housing dollars should go directly to Native communities so that we can start solving this crisis of homelessness for ourselves. We believe in the Native community that the way that we will find healing is if we can be able to take care of ourselves and take care of our community again. So um, I could 
wax on for a long time about this in a, in a very dramatic way because I am passionate about it. And I believe that the way we solve for all homelessness is to solve for native homelessness. And that is a, that's a hard thing to say. It's a hard thing to really grasp and put our, hand, our head around it. But if you think that about native people, the indigenous community of this place and around the country, if we are the most likely to be homeless, we're completely out of balance as a system. And we have to figure out a way to get back into that balance. Just to let you, yes. Just to let you wax a little bit more, have you seen any policy proposals, like any specific things that would actually address the disparities from the candidates so far? Oh, from the candidates. Well, not necessarily. I think I think that it's hard. You know, you, when you think about you know the fair housing laws, like when you get into that, you, you, it gets it gets really tricky, and and you have to um, understand um, the how we can work around those fair housing laws, that in many ways um, are not working for people of color communities anymore. But we, but there are policies out there that we, that we can begin to um, get behind, and I and I have heard some candidates talk about community preference, for instance. So if you have been been removed and your family has been pushed out because of gentrification, and if you can prove that, then, then we're going to give this housing that we're building now, we're going to give you um, a, a preference to come back and come back into the community. Um, there are um, candidates out there that are talking about redlining and talking about the gentrification and, dis and, re um, and, and we have to be able to have candidates that are understanding it and talking about it and also who are going to be innovative because frankly there are not a lot of people out there talking about this you know um, uh, we, we don't have really great policies at the moment that can help push it forward I will say that um, there's a lot of real good intent there's people that are like yeah we're, we're, you're right Colleen absolutely and then there's no follow through and there's because it's hard but we have to be bold and we have to be innovative and we have to know that that if we want to take this on and we want to solve homelessness in our in our in our city and in our county, then we have to address the race disparity. Right. right. I mean, picking up on that. Sorry. You know, uh, well, I was just going to add that you know, I, building on Colleen's thoughts here, you know, one of the ways that we need candidates to start focusing on addressing these inequities is by preventing homelessness in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. It's people of color that are far more likely to fall into the system, and then we do a terrible job once they're in the system of getting them out. And so thinking about sort of the balance of both investing in long-term housing solutions for people who are experiencing homelessness and moving upstream to prevention is critical. And they have to be willing to go to bat for uh, building, whether it be shelters or permanent housing, in their backyards. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone says that, right, until it's actually happening. And you have um, neighbors and uh, voters in your community who don't want that shelter or that housing unit. And you got to be able to stand up to them. I mean, to follow up on that, when we think about what gets people flowing into homelessness and flowing out of homelessness, what is something that the city council can do to stop the STEM into homelessness? Because I know it's much larger federal stuff, but what can the city council do? Well, one of the things that um, the council and the state legislature um, have done is uh, make it much harder to evict people. And so following through on that, um, and that legislation is just going into effect um, from a state level this month, that should have a profound impact on the number of people who are evicted. Um, making sure that people, um, when they are at risk of homelessness, we know who those folks are, making sure they have the financial resources to stay in their homes. Um, that sounds so common sense, but right now, if you are a family and you don't have rent next month, you have to go all over town. You go to a church, you go to a Colleen's organization, you go all over trying to cobble together resources. It's inefficient and it doesn't work very well. You know, we know um, and have seen as a community that having uh, significant numbers of uh, flexible funds for diversion helps people move out of homelessness. We need the same thing for rent assistance for people that are right on the verge. We've got to keep them in housing. I mean, Richard, are there policy things that the city can do as far as medical, like helping with the medical impact? That seems like a really difficult problem. Um, and and the, the medical and the housing are tied so closely together. And, and I'd you know, add just, um, uh, you know, my, my worry is that as there are good evidence-based interventions going forward, and as kind of like you said, homelessness being a, being a symptom of prosperity, if and as the boom continues and we see a greater influx of, of um, kind of uh, individuals taking high-paying jobs from outside Seattle, 
putting more pressure on the, this current housing stock that this problem, despite the, the point in time count numbers this year showing a slight decrease, my worry is that things will get worse before they get better without kind of bold and scalable interventions. Um, um, but medical, I, I think of um, uh, housing or, or some, some form of shelter as the platform of success for any medical interventions, be it physical health, mental health, substance use disorders. Um, it, these, this idea of enhanced shelters, which has got a lot of press over the last year or so in Seattle, this idea of a shelter where someone can leave belongings, they don't have strict curfews, they're not getting kind of saying, you know, so, so long at 7 a.m. and then have to wait till kind of evening hours to get in. That can be a really big um, platform for stability for folks. And I've had a number of my patients who when they get into that enhanced shelter, they've got a place to put their belongings, their medic medications are more safe, um, they feel a sense of stability, they're not um, kind of... Um, for some folks, they're not enduring some of the abuses and traumas um, that can happen to individuals, particularly women who are um, kind of living unsheltered. Um, health outcomes and the ability of, of kind of our health teams to work with individuals um, increases tremendously when they're in permanent supportive housing, if they've been chronically homeless, if they get into enhanced shelter, a number of a number of my clients are working. They work in the construction in industry. They are working in kind of the gig economy, but living in an enhanced shelter because they have that base level of stability. Um, so definitely scaling that um, permanent supportive housing, fantastic resource, should be viewed as a great, um, but that can be um, and a more of an immediate kind of um, intervention for folks that definitely improves medical outcomes. Um, the, the last thing about addiction treatment, which I know has gotten a lot of press as well, is um, um, there has been this kind of myth that a lot of people don't want addiction treatment. And, um, and I think there have evolved in King County um, uh, models of addiction care that are much more responsive to the needs of individuals. Um, and I tend to think of it as kind of like if you're, if you're a business and you're selling a product and nobody wants to buy your product, you don't throw your hands in the air and say, well, you're a loss. You make your product better. And that's what's happened with addiction care over time. We've, um, we as a community have been better about um, kind of treatment on demand, about removing barriers to care, to accessing care that aren't evidence-based, kind of more arbitrary barriers. Um, and this is particularly notable around opioid use disorder, where the, the best practices are getting people on one of the three forms of medication treatment. Um, that is scaled rapidly, you know, and a hat tip to King County Public Health, which has been driving a lot of this culture change within the medical community. Um, uh, mental health, I just kind of say assertive community treatment or assertive community treatment teams, ACT teams, can be really powerful. These are mental health teams historically focusing on kind of severe mental illness, um, psychotic disorder, disorders, severe mood disorders, where they will go to the person. Um, so again, with a, with a lens of trying to make it as easy as possible. We all love easy. Um, you know, a lot of Amazon getting, doing well because it's super easy. We just need to make our medical services easier, um, trauma-informed, um, kind, of kind of noting what Colleen said, and kind of with a lens towards harm reduction rather than kind of aiming for an immediate kind of perfection of optimization of all health issues, of making the, that progress in reducing harms. Um, can, and kind of we, we are on that path. We just need to scale it. Can I just add two quick things, um, agreeing with everything that Richard said? Um, one, uh, candidates should be expected to take um, methamphetamine seriously. Um, meth accounts for stimulants account for more overdose deaths than opioids uh, in the last year. And um, there's no question, too, that methamphetamine, more than any other substance use dynamic, is driving this sort of crisis of public confidence about whether things are out of control. Um, Innovation is needed here. The, the type of um, shifts in terms of accessibility and efficacy that Richard's talking about has not occurred in, the enga in engagement with people who are um, methamphetamine users and stimulant users. I am super 
bummed out to report to you, um, our team just proposed to the, um, to the city that a million dollars that was set aside for treatment in the 2019 budget be allocated to a very innovative stimulant replacement therapy program that would be paired with housing. And um, city officials are turning down the opportunity to work with doctors and public health officials who are excited about this and they're just gonna plow it right into um, further funding for um, opioid treatment, which is important, but pretty robustly funded at this point. And it's just like a blinder around, you know, the issues of the day uh, have moved and we have to thoughtfully respond in partnership with the most innovative um, community and public health leaders. And there's just a failure to do that. So that's number one. Number two, there's an enormous amount of money that's flowing into King County through the Medicaid waiver. Um, and no city leadership in sort of auditing. So I would say candidates should demand an audit of the Medicaid waiver um, investments that are happening in King County to make sure that there is a comprehensive strategy to engage highly marginalized populations, people who are homeless. That could have been funded intentionally and it was not. No strategy to reach that population was among the investments that was chosen, that were chosen, but that could change. And the city of Seattle should demand that it change. Candidates should ask for an audit of the Medicaid waiver to make sure it's reaching people who are homeless. I'll just give a reminder to pass up your note cards. Or that's already been done. Okay. <laughs> oh, we can use more, so I'll yeah, we're missing a few questions. I'll do a round and circle and collect. Okay. Um, getting to some of the last questions, uh, one of the, I think, political paradoxes of this is that everybody loves homeless housing until it goes in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I know this is like the sort of fundamental issue of city politics everywhere now, but Colleen and Lauren, maybe you guys have ideas like what, what can city council candidates do about the, I guess, NIMBY problem? Um, well, I think one of the things is that there are lots of people who want to help, right? But we don't really do a very good job, and Colleen mentioned this earlier, of mobilizing them. So I was in a room this morning with dozens of donors and activists who, are, who care a lot about college student homelessness. Those very folks are the people that we need out at town hall meetings. Those are the folks that we need to figure out how to mobilize in a new way. And I think that that could help change the paradigm hmm. because okay. they're, they're folks, whether they are you know, in corporate America or they are, you know, have been donors uh, in our community for decades. They just don't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. And I think if they better understood both sort of how hard it is to stand up against those sort of NIMBY activists um, and um, help put their voice toward it, there's some power there that we haven't yet tapped into. Mm -hmm. I love it. I th th love what you're saying. The, the reality is I think that that NIMBY voice is so loud, you know, and so they get a lot of attention and um, I, th I believe in the goodness in the city. I believe that there are people that want to do the right thing. So I totally agree with you, Lauren. I think the other thing I would just go back to because it is a stark reality is that we're racist. And so we need to be checking our implicit bias. We need to be asking ourselves, do I feel afraid when this young African American person is walking towards me and, 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 and deal with our bias? Um, because we have people of color who are overly represented in our system. And I think that that's very hard for us to do in Seattle because we, um, we're, you know, we're, good, we're good, awesome liberals. But underneath those good, awesome liberals are people that are still entrenched in a system that has set us up to, to look at each other with um, racist eyes. And so how do we break through that bias and how do we um, um, encourage each other other to to see each other without um, without those biases really really breaking us down. I'll, I'll give you give you a brief example because I, I hate to keep talking about racism, racism, racism. It's not super fun for me, <laughs> um, but it's important. My um, sibling recently was sharing with me this thought, and I hadn't thought of it this way. He said, "Do you know that our dad, um, who is my dad, is how old is he now? Sixty eight. Do you realize he's only?" 50 years from the genocide. I was like, oh my, I just hadn't thought of that. That means that I'm only 72 years from the genocide. And when we, when we think about these historic instances that have continued to perpetuate um, and continue to have a strong um, influence in our system today, 
but we have to consider our reactions to them. And so um, my, my big message to all of us is, is, to, is to look at those historical um, um, instances that have caused us to be in the situation we're at now, to, 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 to consider our own biases, and to love each other. Mm. Find a way to like love that person that you have had a hard time with or is in your backyard and is, is causing you a lot of pain and heartache. That's how good this city is. I deeply believe that. That's more optimistic than I feel lately, but that's a good... <laughs> <laughs> but we still love you. It's a good rally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one, this is a audience. I've been told that I'm aggressively optimistic, so... <laughs> and dramatic. I mean, I'm, I'm going to end it over share. <laughs> This one is hyper local, and I don't know who wants to take it. But Kyle in the audience, thank you, Kyle, asks, "What do you guys think about the repurposing of the armor armory in Interbay?" Say more. I don't. I don't know enough about it. I guess. I'm not sure. I do either. Maybe Kyle, you want to? <laughs> there. Sorry, that was me. Okay. Hi. There were uh, some talks about the armory in Interbay, right, right by the train tracks and the uh, the bridge there that. The, they're moving and maybe we could make this a place for homelessness and have a bunch of services in one place, that roof that you talk about for medical services mm -hmm. and treatment and housing and all that. Is there any way that we could bring uh, or repurpose this area, this land and these buildings towards solving homelessness? I'd say from a, from a cost effective per, kind of cost effectiveness and what would get you the most kind of um, longevity in, in benefit permanence board of housing. Um, I can't think of anything else to address chronic homelessness better proven than permanent board of housing with a racial equity lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know enough about that specific property, but I think you know what we've seen out at uh, Magnuson Park is when you build housing and you create um, and sort of repurpose um, existing areas, there's a great opportunity there. It needs to be done with intentionality. It needs to be done with the racial justice uh, lens. Um, and uh, we need to be looking everywhere. And so if there are opportunities for, for land, we ought to be all in trying to figure out what to do with it. But where's everybody in a park? I don't <laughs> I oh, can ride a bike. Parking first. Parking bike. first. Sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know enough about that, but I, I will say that I think there needs to be more of those kinds of opportunities for the community to engage with. We need more nav centers. We need more, um, you know, uh, shelter systems that are culturally responsive to the need of the community. And I will say that one of the, uh, I, I just returned from a national convening on native homelessness in Anchorage. There was a group there from. Minnesota, the Red Lake Nation. Minneapolis was having this incredible problem. Um, they had all kinds of pu huge public health concerns that were just weighing down the city. The Red Lake Nation came in and opened up something like you were mentioning. They had some property right in Minneapolis and they said, hey, we'll put up, they put basically put up what we have um, kicked and screamed here in Seattle, the Connex, like big tent thing. And I, when I heard that, I was like, because I was against that until I until I heard this example, because it was led by Native community. And they had all these beautiful ways about the way they incorporated Native culture and spirituality and tradition into a, um, an or, into a, a beautiful uh, organization for everyone. And so um, I'm, I'm all for all new ideas, new ways of thinking about this, because if we continue doing what we're doing, we're going to continue to have a terrible crisis on our hands. Uh, I think this one's a question for Lauren. Um, what do you see as the solutions for coordinating and integrating all of the available services? Hmm. Well, I think, you know, as many of you probably know, there is an effort underway to um, consolidate King County and City of Seattle's um, homelessness resources into um, a coordinated body that we hope is going to have the um, ability to lead in a way that we've never set up any entity in our community to do, um, to have the authority um, and the financial resources to invest in solutions at the scale of the problem. And uh, 
good governance or new governance is not our only solution, right? Um, it's part of it and it will only work if it also includes thinking about how we prevent people how we ch from becoming homeless, how we change policies, how we build more housing. Um, and um, I think so much of that has to be about listening to what clients need, um, listening to what service providers actually see on the ground. I mean, I think your example on coordinated entry is right on. We need to be able to listen and then pivot quickly. And I think what we do in this community so often Often is get bogged down in our processes and sort of have 10,000 meetings and a bazillion consultants and new plans. We need to pilot, uh, learn from it, and then scale what actually works. Is there a but, big, sorry, um, as is typical, right? So that remember the McKinsey report from, yeah. So contracted by the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. never mentioned their right. report. Um, it's like the orphan report, like I'm not the parent of that report. Um, anyway, so McKinsey contracted with by the Chamber to produce this report, what's missing. Governance was one issue mis uh, identified. The other issue identified was the $400 million a year missing. So the, the one is not a substitute for the other, and the one in the absence of the other is setting everyone up to fail. So nobody yes. should let anyone get away with the idea that governance changes have any ability to transform outcomes without resources of a scale that no one has a plan to produce. Yes. <laughs> is there an example of a city that has done that really well, like improve the efficiency of services, like an overhaul? I mean, I think it's hard to say if they've done it well, yeah. right? Like that's, I think, but there are some examples. And I just heard this one out of Portland that kind of was blowing my mind a little bit that when they did pull together the county and the city, they saw, um, and they have the same crisis of native homelessness. So then those are the numbers I'm always watchful of. When they pull those together and they, and they, and they said, hey, we're going to put the dollars towards the, com the, na the native communities who know how to take care of their people, they saw a 500% increase of native people coming into housing. That is bananas. That is success. Like I was like, how how do we how do we figure that out? But they weren't able to do that until they were until they brought together the county and the city, and we're we're on the way. And I, I would just echo both Lauren and Lisa and to say, let's do it. Let's get going. Let's stop like wasting time. I I am so. <laughs> I get frustrated because we, we literally have people dying. Like this is humanity. Again, back to the loving our community. I love these people. I don't want them to die on the streets. So we have to take action and it has to be quick. And I would tell, that's my main message to a candidate. Like lo let's be serious about loving our community. And that means taking fast and furious action and learning as we go. Mm. Uh, Richard, I think this one's for you. Uh, what percentage of needed substance use treatment is being met? Like if you go to the substance treatment plant center, how long are you waiting generally? Come to the plant. I don't know. I don't know the term. Yes. 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 <laughs> I'm really bad. Um, so, 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 great question, and, and I think this goes back to the difference in, in what types of substances. So, um, and, and mainly we're talking stuff. We're not, we're not talking like nicotine, um, cannabis as much. We're talking kind of severe alcohol use disorders, opioid use disorders, or stimulant kind of methamphetamine, cocaine use disorders. Um, opioids. We're doing a much better job with opioids. I mean, we don't want to we don't want to rest on our laurels and kind of um, we keep the momentum going. But the the culture change in the health system around um, making buprenorphine, also called Suboxone far more accessible, doing away with policies that aren't evidence-based. Um, you know, rewind several years ago and we'd say, oh, if you're using methamphetamine, you, you gotta stop the methamphetamine before we'll treat your opioid use disorder with buprenorphine, right? That doesn't make sense, doesn't make health sense, doesn't make policy sense. Um, so that's falling away and we're saying, we're embracing people who are poly, so who use multiple drugs into treatment for opioids. Methamphetamine is is the one that's on the rise, especially across the West Coast. Um, it is, it is um, uh, very, it, it is a complicated, drug um, in the way that it can affect people. It is complicated because there is not yet a, a proven rapidly scalable um, treatment, kind of like buprenorphine or methadone for opioids. It's a medication. It, it is highly effective for opioids. We, we don't have that for methamphetamine. Um, you know, pilots and, and studies have been done. There are some medications which have kind of an incremental amount of efficacy, but nothing that seems compared with 
you know, the equivalent of methadone or buprenorphine. So more research, contingency management does have the best data for methamphetamine um, present, um, at, you know, at present. Um, this idea that if you incentivize um, behaviors, so giving incentives, often it comes, you know, there's various ways that those incentives could come, but you're kind of reproducing a dopamine surge as people anticipate a reward, and that can be, that can be, um, um, really good at changing behavior. So um, the percentage, um, methamphetamine, pitifully low. Um, opioids, much better. Um, cocaine use disorders, also also kind of pitifully low. Um, alcohol use disorder is probably the one where there's the most um, technologies available that we're using the least often. So there are some good medications for severe alcohol use disorders um, and some good researchers at, at UW um, that are really trying to change the needle on that. So more, more to do. This, I don't really know who this question is for. This is an issue that I've come across as I've interviewed more homeless folks, that what do you say to people who say, you know, I don't want to get into government housing because it's dangerous, or I don't want to go to the shelters because my things are going to get stolen? This issue of sort of the roughness of a lot of the services that are available. Um, in Barb Poppy's work three years ago now, one of the true things that um, she found was that for many people who are living in public for this reason, like there's just not a match between the services that um, presently are available, might be available to them and their circumstances and needs, objective or self-perceived, is that you know, for a lot of people, the right answer is um, a unit with a door that locks between them and the rest of the world and the other people in the world, both for the good of them and for the good of the other people, honestly, because of behaviors and the intersection between the person and their environment. They're not wrong that it's going to be very problematic for them. A former client of mine um, is frequently in touch with me about, um, she is a meth user, she um, has experienced increasing psychosis. She uses meth because she's a foster care survivor, incredibly abused in the foster care system. Life has just been unbelievably painful for her. her. And she spent time in the navigation center, but for her, what goes on in the navigation center is not viable. She cannot, it is not good for her. She's making a rational choice to not be in an environment. So I think the answer is listen to those people and make sure that we create a match for their actual circumstances because you're not going to talk people out of the belief that they're going to be damaged by being in very problematic, chaotic circumstances and they could very well be right. Anyone want to add to that? Again, if you consider like all the many uh, historical and ongoing trauma, and let me just say really clearly, it is so hard to be homeless. It is so difficult. It is beyond, I can't even describe to, to you how hard it can be. And, and then the trauma of, of it ongoing when you have already experienced generational historical trauma is just mind-blowing. And so, as I've said before, like the, the Native community and other people of color communities, we really have no reason to trust government systems of housing. <laughs> And so that's why we have to pivot and find ways to offer culturally appropriate housing. My organization, the Chief Seattle Club, we're building um, low-income housing. We're, we're opening um, a new uh, 24 units in the Soto, station, uh, Soto District here very soon. And it will, it will be specifically about Native community and bringing together healing after we have experienced these kinds of traumas. So those kinds of, of pivots are incredibly important in, in, in helping solve for that problem. Mm -hmm. So this is our last question, so we're going to do a lightning round. Um, what's the number one thing that the city council can do to make homelessness get better? Raise more revenue. Have a clear vision for where we want to go and how to get there that people can rally around. Be completely focused on undoing institutionalized racism. Insist that systems, including coordinated entry, prioritize people who have the greatest impact on public order issues in our community to imp increase the base of support for increased revenue and investment. Okay, I feel like a more informed voter. Thank you. <laughs> That's so unlikely.
thank you to our great panelists. Let's give them another round of applause. This was really informative. And Michael, thank you for a great job. I also want to give a big shout out to Primary Residential Mortgage, who bought us all lunch today. So thank you very much for that. Um, and please take a moment to fill out your valuations. They're super helpful for us. There's, we're going to have our helpers by the back door as you, en as you exit. Hand them your evaluation as well as your name tag so we can recycle those. Um, and for anybody who wants more information about getting involved with homelessness organizations, um, we are working on lowering barriers, um, getting people more involved with what's going on with all these great organizations. Um, get this harness this energy, this excitement to be part of the solution. Um, reach out to me at Resolution and Homelessness, um, to Tech for Housing, as well as Seattle U's Project and Family Homelessness, and I want to thank both of those organizations for partnering with us for this great event. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Oh, that is it's really great. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> like I know. Do you mind if I get a photo of you all sure. together just stand yeah. there?